okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. If you're from Hamilton, welcome. If you're here visiting, welcome as well. But if you're from Hamilton, what about the Aki, by the way? <laughs> Do you know my son made me sit in the car outside the European count on Sunday night so they got the last kick of the ball before they went into the count. <laughs> it was fantastic. My poor partner, he's a hippie. Mm. I did send him the, send, send him the line so it was because his wee heart was broken. <laughs> but no doubt the sunshine on leave today. <laughs> Just before we get started, you've got canvas cards there. If you want to fill in the canvas cards and give some of the information at the end of the night about how you felt, if you're undecided and you're not sure, put any comments on it because we, we, we like comments as well. If you put the card in the box at the back, you're in the draw for a bottle of whiskey. What more? Hey. And underneath you've got a yes poster. We might take a wee photograph at the end of the night if maybe you've all decided you're going to vote yes. We can hold the posters up. In the meantime, you can use them as fans. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk a wee bit first and then I'm going to introduce our two absolutely fantastic speakers for tonight. Um, I wanted to be in the chair because I really wanted to control these two men. <laughs> I'm joking, there's no chance that I would control these two men. And would we want to? I want to talk to you about hope because that's one of the themes of this campaign. And I don't want to talk to you about what happened at the weekend and what's happened across Europe because some scary things have happened across Europe. What I want to talk about is looking ahead and looking at the future. So looking at hope. And if you look up the, de- the dictionary definition of hope, it says is an optimistic attitude of mind based on an expectation of positive outcomes related to events and circumstances in one's life or the world stage. And as a verb, its definitions include expect with confidence and to cherish a desire with anticipation. But that sums up for me what I want my Scotland to be. That absolutely sums it up. And I wonder what you hope and expect and cherish for your country. Think about the hopes and dreams that you've got for yourself and your family. When you go through your life, you maybe hope to do well at school, you hope to get a good job, you hope to move to a bigger house, you hope to take part in some world event, you hope to travel the world, you hope to you know, get involved in a charity, you hope to do lots and lots and lots of things that enriches you as a person. That's what you hope. You hope that for you and for yourself. But what I ask you to do is to take that individual hope, internalise it and use it as a hope for your nation. Because we want the same thing for the nation, don't we? We want a welfare state that looks after people. And I looked at the dictionary a lot today. The, welfare de- the, the dictionary definition of welfare is a provision of a minimum level of well-being and social support for all citizens. Do you think we get that now? I don't think so. I'm hoping for a nation that treats its young, its old, its sick, and its vulnerable, and people in need with respect and dignity. That's not a lot to ask, but we don't get it right now. I don't want people to be demonised or marginalised for being young or old or sick or vulnerable or in need. I want a nation that gives hope to all these people, that gives opportunities to their young people, that gives training opportunities, apprenticeship opportunities, job opportunities, that Disney includes sanctions and destitution. Because I see a lot of people come to my surgeries who are facing sanctions every single day. I had a young man at a surgery a few weeks ago, and I met him in Larkhall Main Street on Saturday. He came up with Christina, thanks for that. It's sorted. They wanted to put him on a voluntary um, work programme to do something that they thought he should do, working in a charity mm-hmm. shop, which is very, very noble. But this young man, in order to get the job in the field that he wants, because a graduate was actually doing a voluntary placement with a business to get him a job, but they said that wasn't good enough, so they sanctioned him. That's just shocking. That's not the type of country I want, and that's not what I want for my country. I don't want to be in a nation where you see the likes of Danny Alexander, smiley, sweet little face off, opening a food bank. But we've got many food banks in this local area, and as a constituency MSP, I've done many, many things not for public consumption that I have done for the food banks in this area. Because you just do it, don't you? you? Just get out there and you do it. You don't seek publicity for it. You certainly don't let stand there and smile and say, I welcome another food bank open. No, I'll be smiling when they start shutting food banks down because we don't need them. That's what I'll be doing. Mm-hmm. Be it nursery, all the way through to higher education, we should have education based on ability to learn, not ability to pay. Correct. One wee thing that sticks in my head, and I remember reading on Facebook or Twitter or something, somewhere I've read it, is imagine if the cure for cancer was locked in the mind of a young person that couldn't afford to be educated. Mm-hmm. That scares me. I think we've got an opportunity to change that. 
But our babies, porque no hay ni porque antes que chichi chichi de dignidad y respeto en all of our national health service. An ethical foreign policy where we don't ever, ever, ever send our sons and daughters to illegal wars. Ever. Mm -hmm. A country that we don't have nuclear weapons in. An abomination. Billions of pounds spent nuclear weapons where we've got kids. Mm -hmm. We've got a prime minister on that border. with a food bank and we are spending billions of pounds well. on <coughs> nuclear bombs. The kids there decided that some of their pals were hungry when they came to school, so they started their own food bank. Nine and ten year olds. I say billions no bombs, which is a tagline that we'll all probably use. Billions wasted. The other thing that I want is a written constitution for Scotland. And a constitution is a set of your fundamental principles, your values as a nation, that are underpinned by law. They give you and your state the rights and responsibilities as a citizen, a nation where equality and respect are the founding principles, not just something you do to make yourself look good on the telly sometimes. Principles that your society should have written in to its own constitution. We can do some of this right now, and we have done some of it right now. We've had a pretty good go at it in all the years we've had a Scottish Parliament, and I'd say that across all the parties, have all had a good go at doing some of this right now. But what do we need to really do it properly? What do we need to change some of the things we can't change? What do we need to deal with the reserved powers that we can't use in Scotland because they're reserved to Westminster? It's like you are only all big enough and brainy enough to be able to take that responsibility. I don't believe that for a second. I don't go for the too weak, too poor, too stupid attitude because what I see every single day is amazing people, even the folk, the folk that work at food banks, the folk that work in the charities, the folk that work in all the, the organisations across the constituency. I work where I see amazing people every single day of the week doing their best. Ingenious, inventive, innovative people who make the best of what they've got and make it better. That's the type of Scotland we are and that's what we should continue. But what do we need for that? It's easy, isn't it? Independence. Independence is a nation, a country, a state that actually takes control of its own matters. It means self-determination. I mean, you say self-determination to people rather than nationalist, because not all of us are nationalists. But just because you believe in your nation being an independent state doesn't make you a nationalist either. But I'll tell you something, I would rather have my type of nationalist than some of the types of other nationalists have seen even across Europe and most of England this week. I would rather have that type of nationalist. But then it's about sovereignty. It's about yourself. The self-determination part is about having the control, having the responsibility, having the right to make your own decisions. And see if the decisions turn out to be a mistake. Well, we fix them because we take responsibility for them. And it's one thing we damn Scots are good at. It's fixing stuff when we make a mess of them, don't we? Just need to look at the football team for that. <laughs> Residents and populations are the people who should have self-determination. You should be able to go to the ballot box in 2016 and vote for the government that decides what's best for you in Scotland. We don't get that right right now. <laughs> what we get is the bulk of 50 million people, amazing people, amazing people across the UK, that they make the decisions on your behalf. I would maybe take out a handful of rich billionaires in Westminster that make the decisions for you as well. People who have no idea what it's like to live in the waters, or Blanter, or Edelwood, or Fairhill, or Lapco, <coughs> Kelly's Hill, Strother Hill. Nobody here, none of them have got an idea what it's like to live and aspire and hope and every single day barriers are put in your road. They haven't got a clue. So therefore, when they make decisions all the miles away, they don't make it in your best interest. What you should have is politicians that make the decisions in your best interest because you've told them that's what you want. And then see if I've not done it right. See if I've not done it right in 2016. Please go and vote for my rival. But it's Jackie Bond, so you might do that. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, you then get a chance to go and say, Christina, we didn't like what you did the last four years, so we're voting you. And you know what? I'm a Democrat. I'll accept that. I'll greet for the weekend right enough, but I will accept that because that's what we should do. You can't do that with Westminster. When Westminster imposed the bedroom tax here, how on earth did we ever get to a stage where we tax sick and vulnerable people out of their homes? How did we ever get to that stage? We don't have that in Scotland. The Scottish Government has managed to mitigate it. 
I don't want to mitigate it. I want to go and can well abolish it. Finishing up, because I want to introduce the other guests, and they're great. Think for a second what you hope for. Independence to run your own affairs. Independence to protect your sick and more vulnerable. Independence to give your children, my children, your grandchildren, the kids next door, the best start in life, the best opportunities in life. Hope for the future. It's our time. It's our time. Now. It's time to take control. It's time to take it back. It's time to forge that better nation. A nation of hope, of prosperity, of ambition, of good, solid values and ethics as a nation that values her people, her people above everything else. There's a wee carving in the Parliament, and Tommy will know it, and it was Alistair Gray that wrote it, and it says, it's time to start working as if you're in the early days of a better nation. We're already in the early days of a better nation, but we can make it much, much better. And there's only one word you need to say to do that. And that word is yes. Thank you. To, to all, you know, everybody wants to come along and hear whether you're a yes, you're a no, you're an undecided, or you just, you know, want to hear some more information before you even consider what part of that free section you're in. The Jimmy Reid Foundation is something that I have taken a very, very keen interest on for a number of years. My dad was an old pal of Jimmy Reid, I knew Jimmy really, really well. I remember in Glasgow East by election, I spent the whole day with him. Because Jimmy liked musicals and so did I, so I had a Rodgers and Hammerstein CD in the car. So we were singing in the rain and all that, driving along Shelton Road. Um, we had a great time. And Jimmy talked about the things that I believed in, about a valuable nation, about the people being the value of your nation. And that was the thing that really, really excited me about Jimmy Reid. To think that the Jimmy Reid Foundation has legacy has been carried on through Robin McAlpine is just absolutely amazing. It couldn't have been anybody else, I think. Because once you hear them, you'll understand what I'm talking about. I want you to put your hands together and open your ears and open your minds and open your hearts to Robin McAlpine from the Jimmy Reid Foundation. Far too kind, far too kind. Um, I'm just a wee bit teary, to be quite honest with you. This is a completely common by surprise. My, my grand's been Bear Hill. And she died 25 years ago. It's a while since I've been up this side of Hamilton. And I came up, and I you know this, it happens. All the memories came back. That was the road that we got to walk down. Me and my brother home were old enough to get let out ourselves down to the town centre where we could spend our 50p pocket money in Menzies. <laughs> and this is coming back to me now because I haven't been here. I've been, I've been in Hamilton plenty, but not this part of the town. And I'm thinking about my gran. And I'm thinking, what the hell did I tell my gran about what Britain's become? Genuinely, no. Have I said to my grand, this is the second lowest paid economy among all the advanced economies. This is a country where people have the third work longest work hours in Europe, the least number of holidays in Europe. This is a country with the eighth biggest gap between men's and female earning in the European Union. It's the country with the second lowest level of industrial democracy giving workers a say in their work in the European Union. Only Lithuania is worse. We've got the highest uh, childcare costs in Europe. We've got the highest rail costs in Europe. We've got the third highest housing costs in Europe. But we've got the lowest pension in Europe. Of every country in Europe, we've got the lowest pension. And the third highest likelihood that a pensioner in this country will live in poverty. But even worse than that for me, you know that we are in the country with the lowest disability benefits in Europe. And we are the single country in all of Europe where a disabled person is most likely to live in poverty. No Bulgaria, no Romania or Croatia. Britain. How did this happen? Well, one reason, one straightforward reason, that we've run this country wrong for 35 years. For 35 years, we've run this country as a me-first country. This was Thatcher. She told us that if we all claw each other's eyes out, whoever survives, that will be the best one. And if we just keep that going, eventually we'll be a nation of striving geniuses, of brilliance. But we're no. We're a blind nation that clawed our eyes out. It was the wrong way to go. It's been a terrible way to go. And what's it done to us? What it's done to us is it's left a country where trust is at its absolute rock bomb. This, it's an honest I find it impossible to believe that this country is the European country with the lowest level of trust in its government and its politics in Europe. 
The Greeks trust their government more. The Irish, the Spanish, the Portuguese, they trust their government and their politicians more. Because at least they know honest corruption when they see it. More than the devious bandits and corruption. What they said was it's like Darwin. It's like evolution. Just let the biggest bully win and somehow that's going to be better for all of us. Well, I'm going to tell you that they haven't got a clue about Darwinian evolution. Because the thing about Darwin was he said not that the strongest win, but that the most effective win. And what's the most effective way for an animal to survive? It's to work with other animals. That's the truth. I don't know if anyone saw that brilliant Horizon documentary about what cats do when you're not watching them. Having a cat. Fascinating. Um, honestly, watch, it's brilliant. The cats are just brilliant. And one of the things which was really interesting was you know that business where cats use cats arching their back and sparing their claws, hissing at each other? That's not so they can fight. That's so they don't have to fight. Because see, if a cat fights, even the winner gets that hurt, they'll probably die. So if anyone tells you that we've got success in life, in biology, in society, by letting the biggest bully win, they know nothing. All it does is do exactly what it's done in this country. It creates monopolies and cartels. Four companies control, uh, well, six companies control energy. Four supermarkets control the entire food supply for most of the country. We've got a couple of com companies on the private sector now that do our mail and our post. We are trapped. Stuff we cannot survive without is controlled by people who run monopoly and who run cartel. And what do they run it for? You're good? No. But I, I, Tommy will probably rip into this mayor. I want to get off. I want to get on to a thing, which is to say, this is not about despair. Because the one thing I want to say when I'm presuming there's about six minutes left is we can get out of this. One of the things that the other side is desperate to do is to pit your heads down. You know they talk, call it Project Fear. And it's this idea it's fear versus hope. That's not true. Because fear is not necessarily an emotion that stops you acting. Imagine you open a door and there's a tiger. You're not going to stand still. Fear can be motivating. That's not what they want. They want your confidence down. Because the key thing, the big difference about whether people, ordinary people, working people, the big difference about whether they do something or whether they don't do something isn't fear or hope, but confidence or lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. So they want you on your knees. They want you doing. They want you anywhere but on your feet with your heat up. So all I want you to do is give you a reason that you can tell your pals about, that you can explain to them there is a reason for us to stand on our feet and keep our heat up. Let me explain it in five minutes. What's a decent salary? What do you see? A salary which is enough that you can feed your wains, pay your bills, participate in society, live. You've not got a tax lawyer, you're not buying Italian sports cars, but you're not relying on benefits and food banks. A decent salary. 25,000 to 35,000 pounds? Sounds like an idea. Everybody working in Scotland today, only one in five earns between 25,000 and 35,000 pounds. Of everybody who works full time, uh, 3 out of 5 earn less than £25,000. Half earn less than £21,000. And if you are earn £14,000, you're still better off than a third of our working population. The poorest 10% of people in this country in full-time work earn £6,000 a year. What do you think that the poorest 10% in Norway earn an average in a year? Hmm. £25,000. Their poorest 10% earn the same as their entire uh, uh, working population on average. And this is all for the same reason that I mentioned before. We created an economy which is all about seeing not how you can make value and create value. Um, these are the things that make people wealthy. Making value, creating value, skilled labour, skilled work. We instead went for a completely different model. It's called profit maximisation in their minds, but what it really means is how can you get the most out while putting the least in in the shortest period of time? That is not investing in people. It's not investing in manufacturing or making or doing. What you do is you buy a field and you put sheds in it and you fill it with cheap rubbish, well, cheap good stuff, from China. You sell it more expensive. You close down people's high streets and their local businesses. You take all of that away. All that money used to be in your local economy. And where is it now? 
It's an, it's an, a fast train straight out to the equity owners of all the companies that have closed down this high street. I couldn't believe a few years ago I came back to Hamilton. I remember Hamilton was a proud town. In fact, my granny, respectable working class, my granny always thought it was fairly posh. And I parked here recently and I came at the New Cross Centre and I came down and I said, my God, I can remember when that was built. It was a big new hope for Hamilton. And now it's just a wee den of payday loans and pawn shops and pound shops. What happened? These people ruined our communities. And in doing that, they left behind low pay jobs. Now that's the key. Because if you have skill, you are creating value. The profit comes from your hands. If you just do what they do, which is speculate, then you don't need skill. How much skill do you need to buy a house and wait for five years, sell it and buy two, sell it and buy five? That's what's happened. Seven of the richest people in this country are property speculators. And where does their money come from? It doesn't come from doing anything. It comes from controlling the housing supply. And by controlling the housing supply, they can push the prices up. It comes out your pockets. Young families try to build a house. Or it comes from your pockets when you shop in the high street. Or it comes from your pockets when your bank rips you off. Again and again, the industries and the businesses that dominate this country have one aim. Get as much out of your pocket while putting the least into the country they can and do it as fast as possible. This is no good. It will not work. If we reverse it, it solves all our problems. And let me show you how. We've got a paper on our website, uh, readfoundation.org, um, and the Common Mail website, this is all from Common Mail, maybe mention that in a minute, um, it's all of us first org. We've got a paper on there. And all we did was we took the Scottish tax model, so that's everybody in Scotland, all the tax bans, everything. We didn't change anything. We didn't increase the size of the economy. We didn't increase the tax rates. All we did was distribute wages in the economy fairly, like they do in a Nordic country. As many people in work, as even fair a pay within the economy we had, we ran that tax model again. <coughs> it generated four billion pounds of additional tax without putting taxes up at all. We do not have a problem with taxes in this country. We do not have a problem with public services in this country. We have a problem of people that have got no money in their pockets. If people have got money in their pockets, they pay their taxes. It creates strong public finances. That creates the ability to invest in the public services that we want and to raise the lawful level of benefits that we have for people who need help. We can do that. Everything else changes. <coughs> you know what the Tories say. Where's the money coming from? The next time they ask you that, you turn around and you tell them where the money's coming from is to put money in the pockets of your people so they pay their taxes and they get the services they want. How do we do it? Oh my God, in two minutes. Right, how we do it roughly is we've got to see the economy, despite what those me first idiots told you, the economy is not somehow in a bubble which is outside your society. They, they will say that the economy is not something that you're allowed to have an opinion on because it's some sort of magical device that only they're allowed to play with. Sorry, no. The economy is part of your society. Your society is a democracy. So if we want to change our economy, we have a democratic right to do it. Can it be done? Yeah. How can it be worse? <coughs> Everybody else is better at this than us. There's only two countries in the developed world which over the last 30 years have seen a drop in industrial output, making and doing things. One of them is France, 4% drop. The other is Britain, 35% drop. Jeez. Every single other country varies from 18% to 100% increase in their industrial production. What do they do? They invest. If you take every single penny of investment in this country now, that's the public sector, the private sector, even the personal investment that you maybe make by doing uh, training or learning, if you take all that investment and you add it up, it's not enough to cover depreciation. Depreciation is how much money you've got to put in just to keep things as they are. We are negatively investing in this country. Investment is another way of describing hope. Investing is to say we're going to expend time, effort and resource now because we believe it will make the future better. And Britain doesn't invest, it speculates. It's an anti-investment culture. So we invest. We invest in our people. We invest in our business. Because what has screwed life for working people has also screwed life for small business people and medium-sized business people all over this country as, as well. We are all in it together in one thing. The corporation screwed the lawyers. 
We can take this back. We can have this again. We need to invest in industry. We need to look at where our strengths are. Our strengths are still in a shit building industry that's being neglected. We could be building hydrogen ships. The new technology which is going to dominate the seas in the future. We have in this country the expertise to create hydrogen batteries. This is the technology which is going to drive cars and vehicles in the future. Do we want to have that technology created in our universities and then bought by a multinational corporation so it can be made in China? Or do we want to do it here, collectively between us? We see, this is the Commonwealth Project and the from the Jimmy Reed Foundation, we say let's start setting up national mutual country uh, companies. Every single Scottish citizen gets one non-tradable share in a national company. And that company can build industries that can invest in the kinds of jobs that will make this country an exporting nation with people who work with skilled hands to make and create and generate the wealth that will change this country. Can we do it? Yes. Yes we can do it. Because all I really want you to know is that everything that we need to build that better Scotland, we have the resource, the people and the will. We have got the will in this country to change things. We just need people to believe it can happen. So, after that little rant, all I can say is that we are in a position now. We are in a position to change everything. We've been working on this, this, pro this project for a year in the Jim Reed Foundation. Um, Fifty major reports and papers which are describing how to transform everything from energy to democracy to housing to tax and spend, everything. We think it's probably the single biggest project that has ever been done on the transformation of a nation state in modern history. We're launching it on Sunday. It's all going to be written up in a book. And there's one thing that I absolutely demanded from this book. I demanded that anybody, any educated school leaver can read this book and understand it. Because that's another thing about um, Britain. Uh, it might as well be carrying out public life in Latin for all it means to these people. The jargon and the rubbish that they talk. So it's time we started speaking clearly and simply. So I hope that you can all, it's going to be 5 we can't eat it away, we'd love to, but we can't. Um, we hope you can buy the book and read it and see how this will change. How Scotland can be because, to finish, we have had 40 years of me first politics and we all came second. We need the powers, and we need the will, and we need everything that comes with it. And if we do, we can create a Scotland that's not me first, but a Scotland that puts all of us first. Thanks. Yes.
thanks very much, Christina, for that um, lovely welcome. And thank you very much for your applause, brothers and sisters. Hopefully, we'll still have applause at the end of that mm. contribution. Um, just as an aside, Christina said, um, would I mind being introduced as a politician? I've got to say, in the independent Scotland that I envisage, I want us to not only have a constitution that enshrines the rights of every man, woman and child in our country. I also want a contractual obligation between the political parties and the electorate. I'm fed up getting manifestos that are the equivalent of toilet paper. I want manifestos that can be legally enforced and I want politicians that can be removed for not doing after elections what they said they were going to do before right. elections. Right. No, right. Thank you. Not, with, not within four years, brothers and sisters, I want us to have the ability to have right of recall written into our constitution so that politicians can be recalled at any time not just at election time because in relation to that point my opinion of politicians is a bit like nappies they should be changed regularly and for the same reason <laughs> I'm hoping, brothers and sisters, to address three sections of tonight's meeting. I hope to address those of you who are already convinced that you're going to vote yes. My appeal to you tonight is not just to be a yes voter, but to become a yes crusader, a yes ambassador, a yes campaigner. So it isn't the case that it's no use coming to meetings like this if you're already decided. It's important that you come to meetings like this even if you're already decided so that hopefully you will find some extra energy and inspiration to go and convince one other person. Because if everyone who is already convinced to vote yes can convince one other person then on the 18th of September, we are going to deliver independence for Scotland. That's as simple as that. I want to also address those of you who have come along tonight undecided. I hope you will listen to what has already been said and what I'm going to say. And you'll listen to the answers to the questions that we'll receive. And I hope you leave this room no longer undecided, but convinced that you're going to vote yes. And I also want to address my remarks to those of you who are here tonight and you are convinced you're going to vote no. My appeal to you after tonight is at least give it more thought. At least listen to what we've got to say and think again. You know, that bad word was used by Robin several times tonight Thatcher <laughs> <laughs> he mentioned he mentioned Thatcher and it's appropriate that he mentions Thatcher we took on Thatcher we took on Thatcher as Christina has already said at a time when she was at the height of her power I can remember in 1989 when we started the fight against the poll tax we were told that we didn't stand a snowball's chance in hell because we were facing the iron lady she'd already taken on the miners, the printers the health workers she'd already according to her own press taken on Galtieri mm. she was invincible Brothers and sisters, ordinary working class folk, and it started here in Scotland, remember, because we got it a year early. That was our punishment for giving the Tories a kicking at the 1987 general election, where we reduced the number of MPs from 21 to 10. 
And the Tories realised then that it was a doing. Now they look back and think, can we not get another doing? <laughs> there's no <laughs> more bloody pandas in Scotland than our elected <laughs> members of Parliament for the Tories. Right. They look back. They look back at those days of getting a doing as the halcyon days of the Tories in Scotland. <laughs> Our punishment, and by the way, bear this in mind, our punishment for voting against the Tories was we got the poll tax a year early. They said there was nothing you can do, and we said no, there is something you can do. You can organise, you can agitate, you can get the communities together to stand united against the hated poll tax. And by the way, the biggest recruiting sergeant to that campaign wasn't he Tommy Sheridan or anybody else. The single biggest recruiting sergeant was poverty. That's what forced people to fight against the poll tax. And what happened? What happened, brothers and sisters, is against all the odds, ordinary working class folk united, and we melted down the Iron Lady and we sent her off to the political knacker jab where she belongs. That's what yes. we <laughs> And we face, we face today, brothers and sisters, the same odds and some. Because the whole of the British establishment is standing against change. Is standing against the idea of independence. If you think the propaganda has been one sided up to now, you watch what's going to happen in the next four months. They will pour everything out. They will bring out the so called big guns. <laughs> I had to laugh, eh? <laughs> eh? Lord Robertson! Lord Lord McConnell Lord Fox <laughs> the four bloody horsemen of their complex <laughs> been brought out to frighten us all these were the big guns as I've said before and I'll say again if those four unelected lords are the answer then you're asking the wrong bloody question that's the reality <laughs> The only reason those lords with their red ermine robes are so opposed to independence is because on the 19th of September they'll be redundant, they'll be getting their beat. Yeah. Yeah. You see, we have to bear in mind. Thatcher at the Royal Geographical Dinner of 1989 addressed the rich and the wealthy and she said there was no such thing as society. Just a collection of individuals. Well you see here in Scotland we've always rejected that as a philosophy. We don't believe there's no such thing as society. We believe in helping one another. We believe in looking out for the neighbours, the pensioners, the children, the vulnerable, the disabled. That's what makes a society. She went on at that dinner to say that we should, quote, glory in inequality. Glory in inequality. Because she believed that eventually the wealth would trickle down. Give everybody at the top as much as possible and eventually it will trickle down. Brothers and sisters, when I spoke in Kirkcaldy at the, in January of this year, at that time Oxfam had done a survey which showed that 85 billionaires on our planet, 85 individuals, had more combined wealth than half the world's population. 85 people with more wealth than three and a half billion people. 
As I speak to you here tonight in Hamilton, it's not 85 people, brothers and sisters, because the wealth accumulation has got even more unequal. It's now 67 billionaires owning more wealth than three and a half billion. For those who said in the 80s that they believed in the trickle down theory of economics, we say we're still waiting. We're still waiting for our share of that wealth. And I'll tell you what, you'll wait a long time. <coughs> Oxfam produced a report only last week in relation to what's happening here and now. What did they say? They said the UK government's welfare cuts and changes to taxation have encouraged economic inequality so intensely that they amount to speeded up Thatcherism. Jesus. Speeded up Thatcherism. They go on to say the divide between rich and poor is widening faster than in the 1980s. The slashing of UK welfare benefits and simultaneous cuts in tax credits means that inequality will have soared twice as fast by 2015 than it did under the 1980s. And here's the sting in the tail. Here's the sting in the tail. The worst of the cuts are still to be implemented. Brothers and sisters, people ask me all the time in these meetings. Can we be certain that an independent Scotland is going to be better? Can we dot the I's? Can we cross the T's? Brothers and sisters, I believe an independent Scotland will be more prosperous, will be more economically active, will create more jobs with better pay, with better public services. I believe an independent Scotland will look after pensioners and children and the disabled better than what's happening today under the UK. I believe all of that. Can I be certain? No, I can't stand here and tell you I can be certain. But I'll tell you what I can stand here and tell you. I'll tell you what I can be certain about. If we vote no on the 18th of September, then on the 19th of September, there will be more cuts more poverty, more austerity, more food banks, more inequality. You can be absolutely certain about that. And if you... If you seriously value the idea of a society where you can bring up your children, where you can bring up your grandchildren, Will they get a better life than you got? Will they get better opportunities than you got? Will they get the chance to realise their potential, whether it's academically, whether it's in skilled trades? If you value that, brothers and sisters, you have no alternative but to vote yes on the 18th of September. You know, last week, last Thursday, we got a glimpse into the future. There is no crystal ball here. But I'll tell you what, <coughs> if you look at what happened last Thursday in relation to both the Euro and the local elections in England, it is now quite clear that the next general election will not be bringing in Mr. Ed Miliband, who quite frankly you wouldn't trust to run a bath, never mind run a country. <laughs> what will happen in May of next year is most likely to be the election of a right wing reactionary conservative UKIP coalition. Not here in Scotland. Not here in Scotland. But I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters. Unless you are willing to stand up and be counted on the 18th of September and vote for independence, then yet again, as has happened for over 35 years since the last Second World War, yet again Scotland will get a government that it didn't vote for. Correct. That's the reality now facing us. 
None of you can say you haven't been warned. I make the point at these meetings, I think it's very important about what independence is about and what it's not about. I usually give a wee analogy that I'm going to give in a moment. But I was thinking of a new analogy. It's a new analogy because on Sunday there we were invited to one of our daughter's friends' Holy Communion celebration. And when we went into the Covadis pub in Paisley Road West, the DJ was playing music and it was very loud and a lot of the kids didn't like the music. And they were complaining to their mums and dads that it was adult songs that they wanted one direction and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? We went up and spoke to the DJ and he changed the tunes. Brothers and sisters, think about independence. Think about the ridiculous situation whereby people say, I'm not voting yes. I don't like Alex Salmon. <laughs> I'm no voting yes. I don't support the SNP. Brothers and sisters, I think we should applaud the role of the SNP over many years in keeping the question of independence on the political agenda in Scotland. But let's be absolutely clear. The 18th of September is not a vote for Alex Salmon. It's not a vote for the SNP. It's a vote for freedom for your country. That's what it's all about. <laughs> when people say sometimes, Tommy, are you not over egging the pudding? You're talking about freedom there. We're not exactly in shackles. We're not exactly in handcuffs. We're not exactly in prison. And believe you me, I know a thing or two about that. <laughs> <laughs> I say to them, tyranny comes in many shapes and forms. We are voting for freedom. Freedom to decide which government we get. Freedom to decide that instead of spending £2.1 billion in the most expensive scrap metal on the planet, immoral, illegal nuclear weapons, we're instead going to spend that money on new schools, new hospitals, doctors... <laughs> on the 18th of September. It's as simple as that. You want to save your mail service and keep it in public hands? Vote yes on the 18th of September. You want and value the idea that local authorities have the ability to have elderly care, child care, disabled care. If you believe that those services should be provided by the public services, vote yes on the 18th of September. Brothers and sisters, I vote no is to bring in darkness, the lights of which we've never seen. Darkness in relation to these political space cadets in Westminster. <laughs> 29 members of a coalition cabinet, 23 of them personal millionaires. What do they know about poverty? What do they know about working in a low paid job? What do they know about bedroom tax and council houses? You know, here's two reports. Poverty in the first year of the coalition government rose by 900,000 people. 900,000, 300,000 kids more living in poverty 
90% of them, the working poor. These are the people in benefit. These are people in low pay. By the way, here's another report from Philip Beresford, who since 1989 has compiled the rich list in Britain. You used to go into the rich list, the top 1,000, if you had a million pounds, if that was your personal wealth. Now you don't go into it unless you've got 85 million pounds. Here's what he said. Here's what he said last about last year. Philip Beresford, who has compiled the rankings since 1989, said, I've never seen such a phenomenal rise in personal wealth as the growth in the fortunes of Britain's 1,000 richest people over the past year. The richest people in Britain have had an astonishing year. Tax cuts for millionaires, bedroom tax for the poor. That's the reality of UK government. That's the reality of the Westminster village. Brothers and sisters, if you want to continue that, I think you're mad. <laughs> I think you're failing to look at the bigger picture of a country, Scotland. Think of what Robin mentioned. Think about what he said, the potential that exists in our country. I was fortunate enough to go to Stirling University in 1981 and study economics. And I learned about we theory. It's called the marginal propensity to consume. And it sounds high for looting, but it's actually very simple. And it's what turns the economy. What does it mean? It means if you give a millionaire an extra tenner a week, they don't spend a single penny. Okay. Because they've already got everything they need. It goes into your bank, it's unproductive. You give a low paid worker an extra £10 a week, they spend every penny. Mm -hmm. And when they spend that extra £10 a week, it creates demand for the goods and the services that they're spending on, <coughs> which creates employment for the people that are supplying the goods and services. And what Robin's talking about is if we had a higher national average wage, not only would we generate more tax and have more revenue to spend on our pensioners and our schools, but each and every family would have more disposable income to spend in their own households. Go on a couple of holidays a year. Buy new white goods. Look after the house a bit better. All of these things are possible. Remember the words of the great Nelson Mandela. Poverty is man-made. Poverty can be unmade as well, brothers and sisters. What we need is a political will. I believe, and my closing remarks, because Christine's going to get a big hook out in a minute <laughs> and pull me across the flare. I believe, brothers and sisters, that we have only got one choice here. You look at your grandkids. Think 20 years from now if we live in an even more rotten corrupt, unequal society that is full of rich spivs running pension of care for money running all the services for profit and that wean when it grows up says to you Da what did you do in the referendum? and you say oh I voted no and the wean says why did you vote no? And you say, oh, I didn't like that Alex Salmon. <laughs> and the way will say, who? Uh, thanks. That's the reality. That's the reality. That's the reality. That's the reality. Let me finish on this. Let me finish on this because it's comparable to what they faced in 1913. I'm very proud of Labour movement history. Very proud of people like Jim Larkin, who was the leader of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union who led the Dublin strike against the dock companies exploiting the dock workers who were unorganised at that time. And they threw everything at those dockers. 
They used to hire and fire on the basis does your face match. Turn up every day, you had one job one day, you never did a job the next day. They fought the dock owners. They fought the press, they fought the courts, they fought the police. They fought all of the power that was raised against them. We're fighting. We're fighting in this, yes, for all the power that's raised against us. Jim Larkin said, The powerful only appear so because we are on our knees. Arise. Brothers and sisters, 18th of September, my challenge to you is arise. And let's clear a freedom for Scotland. Thanks very much.